Hi everyone, I think the live is working today. Uh, welcome to my uh, live stream on the Carbotech YouTube channel. Today we will be making these little copper covered Christmas beetles, the case of which is really an exercise in carving domed shapes. Um, fingers crossed that the live stream will work <laughs> this month because it didn't work last month. But so today we'll be carving these little Christmas beetles out of Fijian mahogany. Uh, we use quite a range of tools and I'm going to show you how we get a nice, smooth, rounded shape that way. Alrighty, so if anybody wants to put hello into the live chat and then we'll know it's working, but also I wouldn't know how to fix it if it wasn't working. So should we just jump straight into it? I'll just tilt you guys down. So I've just cut this. Oh my gosh, it's working. Okay, live stream is a go. That is good news. Chat is a go. I mean, that is good news. Thank you so much, Anne and Woodwork Learner. I think we're all learners here. So this little beetle shape, I just cut out of this little temple template. I cut it out on my bandsaw. You could use coping saw or scroll saw. This is a bit of Fijian mahogany off cut I had. I'll just rotate that round. Is that a good angle for you guys? Let's hope so. All right, so in rounding out this shape for this guy, sort of his eyes are up here. We wanna be doing this, a bit of this way, and a bit of this way. So I'm just gonna draw a very rough, center line and I don't know if anyone remembers but last month I spoke about the we secured our work with a bit of um double-sided tape and this time I'm using the paper chuck method so if I spin that you can see I've actually got two layers of paper in there so it goes timber PVA paper PVA paper PVA work and then right at the end I'll show you how we remove that. It's really good. I personally prefer it to the double-sided tape way of clamping. The only issue, excuse me, I've just got to do this up underneath my desk. The only issue being that you've got to be prepared enough to over clamp overnight. <clears throat> Alrighty, so about, I don't know, two, three inches long. To start off, I'm going to be using a number 530 so that's a field gouge. Five refers to that sweep there, and 30s is just 30 millimeters wide. Now I've got the bevel side up, if you can see that. And wherever possible, when you're carving a rounded shape, that's going to help you so much because you're going to get a rounded cut instead of a series of scooped cuts. I've got to keep one foot on this tiny, tiny bench to stop it rocking away. But hopefully next month we will be in the workshop with work and internet. Just splitting it along that grain there to try and speed it up a bit. Trying not to bury the corners of my tool in the timber. Now I've carved quite a few things out in Fijian mahogany before. It works reasonably well, but you do sometimes hit really, can you guys see that? Really fibrousy patches that will rip. So keep it in mind if you're carving with it. This out. I think this is going to be a big rip here. So I'm going to flip it around this way. I kind of cut my way out of that because it was getting a bit ahead of me. Now for shaping down around the nose there, which is this bit, so around like that. 
Again, I'm going to have that bevel side up. Anyone has any questions please just pop them in the chat hopefully I'll see them and be able to answer as we go along I've just spun that around so I can start shaping out the back end of the bed a little bit I'm just gonna see if I can that's really not behaving under there tighten that up when connected to a proper solid bench this won't be rocking so much. Like I said, hopefully by next month the internet will be fixed in the shed. Now I've just rolled the tool over so I've now got bevel side down and that's because you can see it's really fibrousy in there and in order to try and sort of work around that. I'm doing really small scooped cuts. You kind of hear a difference as well when it's ripping on that side instead of cutting smoothly. Spin around and this side is behaving. What hammer, th what's that hammer thing you got made of? Um, this is actually made for me. This is walnut and that is brass, I believe, at the end. So it's a little carver's mallet. Um, they work great because they're really sort of heavy at one end, but if you do need a swing, you can hold it back and get a bit of power like that. And I prefer it to a traditional wooden only mallet just because you do get all that weight at the end. Now I'm just doing a real slicey, scoopy cut. I'm regretting my choice of timber with a little bit of fibrous -y section through it, but it's probably better for you guys because then you see how to get out of it difficult situation I'm really just slicing that around now that's the end grain here I'm taking off so I'm really I'm using quite a lot of pressure I'm anchoring off ball of my right hand there I'm right-handed as well but once you get used to carving you'll find you end up carving both ways because it is a lot easier than unclamping your work every time you want to swap angles. I'm just going to try, if I twist this right around, is it going to really tighten up on that bench there? So you can see that by using the bevel side up, I'm really starting to create a bit of a dome shape. If I was bevel side down, again, I'm cutting scoops out of it like that. And I'm gonna get a lot of divots that way. Sometimes you're forced to, because your tools can't fit. And if that's the case, you just remove the high points with lower and lower 
numbered sweeps. Really take it nice and slow. And here. Here I'm cutting straight down through end grains. You can see I'm doing a lot of small, really short cuts, but I'm getting a lot of sweep through there. So I'm rounding the back end of this beetle. Wiggle, wiggle, wiggle. Really trying to create a lot of pressure. So and you probably can see I've got facet, facet, facet. So try and now because I want something round without too many facets. I personally don't really like to go super, super smooth when carving. I like to leave a few facets, but there is a limit to how many I can have. So whilst it's facing your way, we'll just keep rounding the back end. So that was a number five. So now I'm going to move on to a number three. So can you see how that number three there, it's just this curve here is a bit gentler than the curve of the five. So using a lot less effort, just coming along, mark, scraping off those high points. I'm kind of almost just feeling for where they are. And those little curls we're getting, that means we're cutting good and sharp, which is always nice. Now, I saw a comment on last month's video, but I only saw it this morning. Um, and I'll tell you guys here because it's something people are always interested in. People always ask why. See, that's blue, pink, yellow. Why do I color code my gouges? How have I decided to color code? Like, is there a system? Yes, there is. I do it. So if I'm doing a big job and I've got wood chips everywhere, gouges everywhere because I'm not a very neat worker. Um, if I know I'm looking for a gouge with a green handle, it's a lot faster and easier than kind of going through picking up everything because if these are laying on edge, you can't really tell just how big it is. Um, so all my V tools have yellow on them. So if I want a beetle, I know I'm looking for something yellow. All my sweeps five and below, you got the green. Six and above are pink. Uh, fishtails are blue because fish live in water. It's the only colour that's actually got logic to it. Um, and then fancy tools, so your odd cutters or bent back bent gouges are all white can you kind of hear the difference as well I don't know if it sounds good enough but as I'm hitting this fibrousy patch but you can see good advocate it might be a bit bright, is it? Good advocate for the, um, let me just turn that. 
Is that a little bit better? Good advocate for the paper chuck. This little beetle is staying completely stuck to this. Whole bench is moving, but it's not. Again, just working my way across that. You can see I'm still rotating that tool, getting that twist happening. If anyone has any suggestions for future live streams, what you'd like to see, please always let me know. Um, I know we have had a request for rasps in the past, so next month we'll be working on a big project that will probably take us two, two streams to do, um, but that'll have using a lot of rasp work in that next month. You can see that paper's starting to get in the way. So I can just slice that little bit off with my knife there. Now, this gouge is starting to get a bit big to get around there. So both number fives, so the same size sweep, but that's a number 20. So it's only 20 mils wide versus the 30 mils wide there. Really need a good shape around the edge here. Really slicing around, because this is all end grain here. So I'm taking it really slow. Just pull that out and show you what we've got. See, we're starting to get, but you can see we've still got quite a few facets. See that shining in the light? Love this little Veritas vice. So back to number three. And this would work the same if I was working that way around, so the bevel side down. Again, I would start with a higher scoop, higher sweep, sorry, and then just and then you'd have a series of peaks like that. And then you'd come back with something smaller and you'd take off those high points and you just keep working, working along like that. Wiggling that there, each wiggle is a different separate cut as I hit a bit of tough grain. At least with this one, you'll see how to really get your way out of fibrousy misbehaving timber. Now I'm just going to spin that around because I've got a few chunks up here. Anybody watched the stream on um grain direction? It's all the same principles in this it's just we're not carving 2d we're carving that way so 3d but it's the same all the same principles um, and that diagram is still on my website anyone still after that now this little section is going to give me a bit of grief Really little, little cuts there. Um, 
Um, hey, Linda, what other types of timber could be used for this project? Look, anything that's going to carve, basically, um, that's a silly answer, I know, but anything you could get shape out of, um, you know, I've used a fair bit of jelly tong and American walnut in these live streams. They've worked really well. I've even had quite good success with um, just cypress just bought from like the local hardware store that was a veranda post. So that's quite an inexpensive way to get some timber. If it's got quite a straight grain without many knots, then it, ca it can, can carve really, really nicely. Um, do you know, I'll show, show you this. Can you guys see the grain in that timber? I hope you can. Um, the end grain's a good example as well. It's quite close together, the grain. It's not spread out. On the, I think it was on the grain direction one as well, there was a fair bit on what to look at in timber to pick a good piece of carving timber. So I hope that answers your question. New to Brian is new to carving and do I have any tips on sharpening? I would say don't let uh, people <laughs> make out to you like it's absolutely terrifying. Um, it's not as bad as people like to make out. I actually do 99% of my carving, sorry, my sharpening with this chunk of leather. It's a leather strop. This is amazing. I used to use another cutting compound, but I recently got onto the feel um, sharpening compound. So that is just a paste. that you put on your piece of leather. I'll show you with my, do a really quick demo with my um, big gouge because it was getting a little. And then imagine that on a flat bench. And rock like that. So if you keep your tools sort of like, this is called strop sharp. Pack like that. Um, re you won't have to put them on a stone much if you keep them really sharp with this method. That's pretty much it. That is super sharp now. Um, that keeps them really sharp. You don't have to put them on a stone much. I used to use Japanese water stones and, you know, if something's got to be if you drop one on the floor and you've got a big ding out of it. Um, I like to, I used to use water stones, but then I progressed to diamond stones. They're a bit more expensive, but the water stones will get grooves out of them where you've been um, sharpening over time, but the diamond stones do not. So now that that's round enough, I'm going to call it, in an ideal world, I think it'd be a little rounder. I'm going to just start marking out. I've got my little template. I'm going to start marking out my beetle. So I've got center line. I'm yet, this will be the third Better life carved, and I'm yet to manage to draw it out symmetrically. We've got some big eyes here, here, and then another bit. Cool. So now I'm getting some shape. Is that better with the light away? Or is the light on it better? Um, now I've got some lines. I'm going to 
I'm just going to use a really large V gouge. So that's a number 15, eight mils wide. And I'm going to work downhill. Oh, I forgot the part that makes it this funny little triangle here. So wiggling, again, that's lots of little, little cuts. Really giving, going to give me a lot of control. All the way down. One side, do the back. Now, one of the trickiest things to carve is a straight line going with the straight grain because the tool will want to follow the grain. So if your grain has a slight wobble in it, your um, tool will want to have a slight wobble in it as well. Ah, hello, Spirit of Flights. Yes, I'm using Fijian mahogany today. So just a good little scrap that I had in the workshop. Spin this around again. Oh, thank you, Fix It Fingers. Good morning to you too. This might be my most uneven <laughs> beetle yet. I'm wiggling that to really have control around that grain. Just show you that. See that? So I've got all those lines heavily cut with my large beetle. Excuse me one sec. So now with my back to my number three. 3F20. Um, if you follow along, you'll find I use this tool as much as I can because it is my favourite. Just bevel slide up. I'm just taking away a little harshness of that along that back edge there. I'm just using the corner of that tool. Now that I've got that, I'm going to get a, a much smaller beetle, 1221. So 12 is the angle of the V. Sorry, it's so a 12, 4. I read 12 backwards. 4 is 4 mils wide, and I'm just going to ever so slightly clean out that last little bit. Lots of spinning with this guy. Move that edge. Again, I really recommend um, watching that session we did on Grain direction, I think I say that every <laughs> every live stream. Go back and watch that grain direction one. Um, so watching that and also 
downloading that template from my website. There we go. Always odd to hear people saying good morning when it's nearly midnight here. Ah, uh, where are you, Woodwork Learner? America or England? Somewhere else? That's exciting. Just taking the edge off these. Oops. Now, as space is getting tighter, I'm going to switch to a smaller tool, five mils wide, number two. So, again, it's the most flattest of everything I've used. Scraping off this little triangular. I'm trying to cheat and do it the wrong way. I won't. So. Oh, you're in England. Well, welcome to our little Australian live stream. That's really cool that people everywhere are watching it. I had no idea. So just trying to remove the height of this section between his eyes and I don't know what this bit is in beetle terms, but I'm going to call it a nose, really removing that. Now, cut the eyes. I've got a number 11, so you can imagine that's a really tight curve. It's a really tight U-shape there. And look at that. Isn't that amazing how that just fits in there? So it's a stop cut, just went straight down. Then I'm gonna just, just so we have slightly raised eyes. Didn't cut enough, cut that off. See, when I was going there, bevel side up, I dug my corner in there. So now I've got to go bevel side down and just slowly, slowly. Cool. Now I'm just going to come in again with that number 3F and... Cutting in at the sides, so I'm cutting in these little sections here, just cutting straight down like so. Giving it a little bit more of a good shape. It's a bit square, so I can round that off. Really carefully. Cool. So that is mostly done. Now comes the exciting, terrifying part, however you want to think about it. Just a little more knife. You could also use a chisel. Spin your work around to the least precious part of it. So if I would so we're gonna be taking it off this chunk of timber here. So if I was to, if I come in at the back here, if I was to get a chip, it's quite easy for me to work a chip out on this round end here. But as you can see, I don't have much going on waste timber here at the front. So I'm gonna do it at the back. So I'm just slicing it, trying to get it in between two layers of paper there. Ready? This is pretty cool. Look at that. So it's just split in between those two pieces of paper. I always think that's super cool. So now I'm just going to clean that up. 
with my knife. I meant to bring a piece of sandpaper and show you just how quickly you can just sand that back. Um, I forgot to do that though, so you just have to believe me. So I'm just carving a little sort of beveled edge around the whole, that also for seeing the paper. And also it'll just sit ever so slightly up off the table. It's always best to try and cut away from yourself with these knives, especially if you're just getting into using them. There are some cuts, like safe ways to cut towards yourself. That's not one of them. Um, but they can get a little tricky. Would using card make it easier to remove? I don't know. I haven't tried that, to tell you the truth. Um, I can tell you, though, use, like, computer quality paper or better, don't use newspaper or magazine paper. I learned that the hard way. So little beetle guy, and we're going to make him, give him some copper leaf. So first step when you're, so this is, I'm never sure if gilding is technically um, gold leaf only or if it counts for using copper or silver leaves as well. But we're going to just call this gilding. So he's been covered in a copper leaf, gives him that really beautiful shine. First step is you want to prime. Think about what colour you want underneath. If you're using gold, it's always a really nice idea to use red, red paint underneath. Um, I wanted black showing through, so today I'm going to use black paint underneath. So I'm not going to be too... This is just acrylic paint. I'm using it to double as a primer as well. I think I've got way too much on there. Really want to get it in those cracks because they're going to, not cracks, the gullies that we, can you see that against my top? You probably can't. That we carved really carefully. Now, there's no pattern for this guy on my website this week. Um, but I thought he's such a simple shape. You'll be able to draw your own. I also thought this would work really cute as a ladybug and maybe use like silver leaf for the dots or something. That would be nice. And I always like to paint that little bevel as well. Maybe I'll make a hundred of these at Christmas time and have them as Christmas tree decorations. And for our England friend, I don't know if you get them in England, but we get these sort of scarab-like beetles or Christmas beetles that come out at, in the summer here. And that's what this guy is very loosely moulded as. So now that he's all black, going to, when you're doing this yourself, let it dry naturally. Um, that'll give you best results, but... The power of the internet. I'm going to speed things up today. I'm just with a hairdryer, that a blast. So, black beetle. This is the 
exciting bit. So this is called leafing size. It is a special glue that you have to buy to attach your metal leaf. And the one tip I can give you is as soon as you use your brush, immediately straighten a glass of water, otherwise it will gunk up your brush and ruin it forever. Oh, yeah, our Christmas beetles definitely are not this big. They are maybe that big. <laughs> that would have been um, quite fun, though, to let them believe that. So now I'm just painting this. You see that? goes on clear just where I want the copper leaf to stick. want a lot in this little triangle. Avoid his eyes. Gonna give him a bit of a stripy pattern across his nose here. And then um, for his body, I didn't do a very good job on my practice one, but see how that's kind of stripy? Kind of stripey like that with the black coming through, I mean. That's because I deliberately used a quite a coarse bristled brush to apply that size so that I didn't get um, size on all of it so the leafing wouldn't stick to the whole thing. So I've just got a little bit on the end of that brush. I'm just going to. Get it on like this. Let's see what I'm doing. Hope you can. Probably should have worn a white shirt today, shouldn't I? Didn't even think about that. Maybe I'm being a little heavy handed, but that's all right. You could do patterns. So that'll dry clear, but the big thing is you need to leave that size for at least um, 30 minutes for it to go really tacky, for it actually to work really well. So magic of the internet. Here's one I put the glue on, the sizing glue, right before we started the stream. You can see how glossy that is. It's really tacky as well. So we'll get rid of that guy. I'm going to remove, actually, if I bring it out of here. There we go. I'll do my gold, sorry, my copper leafing just here. Remove some of my tools. I should have just blown all that away with the hairdryer. So, big thing to know when you are gilding, your the oils in your skin will 100% upset the you know it's just like it's it's super thin metal so the oils in your skin will tarnish the gold silver or copper leaf whatever you're using so on this guy you can see he's a little looking a little bit oxidized I wanted that to kind of recreate Christmas beetle a little bit better um so I didn't wear cotton gloves if you want your metal leafing to be nice and crisp and to not age, wear cotton gloves now. But I didn't bother because I kind of wanted the age effect. So they just come in sheets like this, paper sheets. And that is one sheet of copper leaf. Can you see that? Now the thing is to not breathe, so I'm going to stop talking.
there we go. So it's super, super, super light. So if you um, breathing on it, if you're doing something a bit delicate or you want it in a really specific place, you will probably just blow it away. So then with a brush, I'm just gonna smooth it out. See that? Starting to take shape. Just gonna break all this off and save that. I found if you wanna um, use really small bits, because they come in these sort of paper leaf books, you can get two pages. So have paper, copper leaf paper, and cut them with incredibly sharp scissors. You can kind of dictate the shape you'll get. And then you just get your brush and really scrub it in. There might be patches that you've missed. And then I'm gonna really rub it in really hard. And now these little black bits here, that's where the sizing glue didn't hit when I brush it up so I can give it. But doing this will um, definitely make the copper leaf tarnish. So once you're finished with the copper leafing, you wanna just use a really high quality, has to be oil-based varnish. Oh God, that's a bit messy, isn't it? It's awful. Um, So like on that bit there, I think I've rubbed too hard. I can try, see if there's any remnants of glue left. Yep. Yeah, you want to seal it with a really um, good quality, has to be oil-based varnish. Just trying to scratch it off around his eyes. Now it's sticking to this um, black paint a little bit. That's all right, that will, that will rub off. Just really give it a rub. There, I've got too much black coming through. So you just get a little Still got a bit of tackiness left in that glue. And if you find out you've rubbed too much off, you can always just put more of the sizing glue on it. And see, I, I won't do it in front of you because we'd have to wait for half an hour. But clearly I think I haven't actually managed to get much sizing glue on that whole band there. So I will um, touch that up and then put some more copper leaf on it. I am in no way calling myself a gilder. So people who are really good at this, please don't <laughs> tell me what a terrible job I'm doing. This is definitely much more of a craft than an art, this little beetle guy. Hello, there you go, we have Two little beetles. Oh, that's really good. You can see this one I did about a week ago and I touched it with my hands heap so it's really um, tarnished, that metal there, whereas this one is fresh and brand new. You can see the colour difference. It's quite a lot. If anybody has any last-minute questions, please pop them in the chat. If not, I'll be signing off very soon. Before I do, um, I'd really appreciate it if you guys could all just like this video, please. That helps things a lot. Um, please subscribe to the Carb Tech YouTube channel. You can follow me on social media on Facebook, search Olivia O'Connor Carving, on Instagram at Olivia O'Connor Carving. Um, my website, oliviaoconnor.com.au forward slash forward slash classes has those 
downloadable PDFs right at the bottom of that page. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and next month we will be carving knots. So that's four views of one knot. We're going to be carving a knot out of one chunk of timber. It'll be lots of fun. I'll be showing you how you can split shapes out of wood if you don't have a bandsaw. So you can just use your carving tools and a saw to get that done. Oh, thanks for the lovely comments, everyone. That's really nice. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. I hope when you apply your sizing glue, you do it a little <laughs> more carefully than I did that one. All right. Um, if anyone has any questions in the future, please send me a message um, via Instagram or if you send it on Facebook, if I take ages to reply, I'm very sorry. They get sent into a folder that I can't find them. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Cheers, guys. Bye.